God we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Give him the praise and give him the glory. You are glorified.
Oh, we were people in here grateful tonight. Are you great? Are you really, really, really great? Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord. We give you praise, honor, and glory, Lord. We're, we just come in the precious name of Jesus, Lord, just to say how grateful we are, Lord. Father, thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. Thank you, Lord, for what you're yet going to do. Thank you, Lord, for working out every situation behind the scenes. Thank you, Lord, for healing from head to toe. Thank you, Lord, for making a way out of no way. Thank you, Lord, for just healing that marriage, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for just healing that family situation. Father, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in the body of Christ. Father, we thank you today, Lord, as we come, Lord. Father, we walk by faith and not by sight. Father, we thank you for the sweet spirit that's in this place. We thank you for just the presence of the Lord. Have your way tonight, Lord, as only you can. Father, you know what each and every one of us needs tonight, Lord. Father, we thank you for the teaching that's coming forth tonight, Lord. We thank you for hitting the mark that you set for it to hit. Father, we thank you for giving us an ear to hear and a heart to receive what thus saith the Lord. And we thank you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Give the Lord another clap of praise. Amen. 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 So this is the day that the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. How many, how many of you having a blessed week so far? Everybody having a blessed week? Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Every day that we can wake up on top of the ground is always a good day. It's always a good day. Just want to share a couple of announcements. This coming Friday, couples, we will be having our couples fellowship here at the church at 7 o'clock. We will be having a fish fry. Hallelujah! Amen. Somebody here from me. We got some shell crackers and bluegills. Uh-uh, don't, don't talk about it now. Grits and some... That's what I get some crab for. <laughs> Amen. 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 So come out. We'll have some fish with the bones. We'll have some for those who are not that experienced. But we have some without the bones. And so we just want all the couples to have a good time. Amen. Invite a couple, bring them as we want to fellowship, play some games, and give some nuggets so that we can be all that God would have us to be within our marriage. Amen. Amen. On July 31st, which is actually this coming Sunday, we'll be having a July celebration at Carney Island, immediately following service, and I'm sure Bishop will elaborate on that a little more. Uh, back to school, uh, it is set for August the 6th, time to be announced. And also Business Expo on August the 20th, you know you want to have a business and would like to showcase it here. This would be a good place to do that on August the 20th. Amen. Amen. Those are all of our announcements. Now it's time for our offering. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. 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 We welcome all those on Facebook and YouTube. Good evening to our Power Up on this last Wednesday of July. Last Wednesday, we are already in July. Time is speeding up. Time is flying. Then we want to share a scripture with you. Yes, man, amen, amen. When we say we prepare our hearts to give, and the Bible talks about that God loves a cheerful giver. And it's not about it's not so much about what you give, it's what has what your attitude is about giving. Amen. It's your attitude. You can give whatever, but if your attitude is not right, nothing the devil means you ain't doing it. So we prepare our heart to give. We give with a cheerful heart. We give with thus says the Lord. We give our ten percent, which is our tithes. Tithes is a tenth, and our offering is that let me give a bottle. As you prepare your seeds and your heart to give tonight, ask God what you should give above your tithe and your offering. Uh, we're living in a season of God's supernatural blessings. And the way we set ourselves up for that is we are cheerful givers. We are obedient to the word as it pertains to giving. And so as we have 
placed ourselves, and we have came into agreement months ago that this is our debt cancellation seed that we are sowing for our campus to be debt free by December 31st, 2022. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All we have to do is get an agreement. Amen. 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 And we walk by faith and not by sight. And so we are still believers. So when you give tonight, your seed should be that we, our camera, will be debt free in Jesus' name. And so when we, when we give to make sure that the kingdom building is debt free, guess what? God will make sure you are debt free. Amen. Amen. You have to take care of the kingdom. Amen. So if everybody prepared their heart to give, cut bottom, if you like to give through cash out, Dollar sign bless D A M M C on 1919 Southwest 27th Avenue, California 34474. Again, Bishop and Pastor Lord, thank you for your continued giving. Again, I don't want to sound repetitive, but every time you pull up on the camera, when the lights are on and the doors are still open and able to be Hallelujah. Open, you make the difference. Amen. It's all because of your faithful giving. Give yourself a hand clap of praise. Yes. For making sure that the needs are met at the kingdom building. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. So, good body, have you received everybody's payment? Amen. As you stretch your hand towards these offerings, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for these tithes and offerings, Lord God. We thank you that we gave them cheerfully with a good heart. And Father, we thank you for the purpose that we've set aside for them to be used, Lord God, as a debt cancellation seat. Father, we walk by faith and not by sight. And Father, we believe in Jesus' name that our cameras will be debt free by December 31st, 2022. Father, we just thank you right now, Lord. We we understand the heart of sowing and reaping, Lord God. Father, Father, we're not, we're giving, Lord God, because we love you, Lord. We give because we love you, Lord. We give because your word says we should give. Father, we thank you for what you're doing behind the scenes with every situation in our life financially. And Father, we thank you that every need be met in this house in Jesus' name. And we thank you and give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. 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 Give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. And Bishop Cole, do you come in here? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Quentin. Elder Quentin, thank you, body of Christ. Yeah. And uh, brother, you grab me a stool and uh, my little uh, uh, thing there. We're going to teach from the floor. Is that all right? I kind of had it up, and my team was so good. They saw something wasn't in order, and they took it out of order. And then put it back to the natural. <laughs> <laughs> but as they're getting together, I want to thank all of you. And as we're adjusting ourselves, thank God for all of you who are part of our ministry and our and what God is doing in this season. We're grateful for the chance to come and to minister to you. If you just bring a little easel there for me. They're trying to get in my chalkboard, but it's tall. And they got to bend it over when you get it through the door. I didn't realize I was going to have to take you through that count. But we're grateful to be able to come tonight and to minister to you the more. Thank you, brother. Thank you. That's wonderful. And we appreciate all of you in your respective places as you have come to support this ministry. We started this ministry in 1999, April. And God has blessed us to be in service for these 23 years. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. It will be 24 years in April. And uh, we thank God. Thank you, brother. And Brother Emmanuel, if you just come and make sure you tweet the camera so we got a nice look. Amen. Brother. Brother Arthur, one more thing. If you can hand me my marker bag, because I'm going to go to the bag every now and then and go to the board. Amen. I'm going to.
teach like a lecture. Amen. 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 Ooh, glory. Come on, that bank bag that has my marker there. Oh, glory. On top of my that little oh, step right there. Oh. <sighs> Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. Thank you. We are so grateful, so grateful. Amen. Well, we are excited about what God is doing in our life. Amen. 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 And we just don't want to miss God in any facet of him revealing himself to his body. Amen. We want to take advantage of what he has made available through his supernatural provision of knowledge and understanding that allows us to be able to glance at this age, this world. I look, me, Mom, you know, Pastor Royal, I want to make sure I look decent. Amen. God bless you. But we thank God for all of you and the chance to teach. And I want to come down from the stage today because I want to make sure I connect and just want to have a more intimate connection and, and communication. And we are going to revisit uh, some of the, of the subject that we began on Sunday as we ministered from the topic, the blessings from generation to generation. And uh, we want to talk about uh, this generation. We want to tap into some of the things that are tied to this generation and the concept of the generation as it pertains to God. Amen. Amen. Let me get my look together. Oh, I see you. I see you, Bishop. That blue looks good on you. Pull me in. That's, that's it. Hide some of that. Girl. Amen. Now I'm ready. Amen. I got the feel all right now. But we want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, the 13th chapter, where we began on Sunday. Now I tell you, a preacher never really finishes his messages. He just puts a pause in it. Because God continues to speak to him before, during, and after he preaches. Amen. We want to say hi to the birthday girl, Deaconess Cheryl in the house. We say happy birthday to you. Pastor Roy, I got a little birthday love for you just to say happy birthday. And we just love you so much and appreciate you. But um, we're going to start with the uh, 13th chapter of the book of Acts where we began on Sunday. And then we're going to go through some of the notes that I didn't have a chance to go through on Sunday. Uh, in the back, the word says, and all that get and get understanding. We're going to get a greater understanding of what God has put in place in this earth realm for us to see Him and to fulfill His purpose. And I, I'm taking this clip from the 36th verse of the 13th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. And this is awesome assessment that, that Paul is giving concerning the life of David in light of the work of Christ. And the 36th verse says, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, say by the will of God, fell on sleep, that means he passed, he died, and was laid unto his fathers, laid unto his fathers, and saw corruption. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you and praise you for this day, for this is the day that you've made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. And Father, as we come to this place in time, as a member of humanity, oh God, we know that you are speaking and revealing yourself and bringing attention to those things that warrant divine attention. 
notice, direction, correction, exhortation. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be used in this hour. And guide us, oh God, and as we teach tonight, speak to your people corporately, speak to them individually, that they may receive the word of God that's flowing. Lord, I humble myself and I abase myself that you might speak and be heard. In Jesus' name I pray that everyone say amen. Here uh, uh, is one of the uh, galvanizing scriptures that the writer uses in a synoptic gathering of um, reflection of the, the, uh, the life of Christ is really the context. He's doing a comparison from David's life to the life of Christ, and he's drawing attention in part to the fact that that uh, David served his generation and he died and he saw corruption, and Jesus came and he served his generation and died but did not see corruption, and he's drawing a comparison of it and how much more, how, how beautiful the life of Jesus is for the believer, how much preeminence it is above David who was highly regarded by his Hebrew peers and, and those of that era. It was to be very much like how many of us in this era would admire the John F. Kennedy and what he did or Martin Luther King and what he did to impact uh, the nation and the world, Gandhi as a world figure and to impact the thinking and the, 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 uh, the, the society that, that he lived in. But I, I was drawn to this passage because I had been studying and reading about the life of David, especially uh, the season of uh, transition as David uh, got older. And you can read that in Second Chronicles and, and uh, of Second Samuel in particular, how David became a king and he served, I think some 42 years, 40 years or so. And then as he was getting older, he had identified his successor and it gave weight to how that succession transition occurred. But what was more galvanizing for me was this passage that corresponded with the life of David, that he served his generation. And God began to minister to me about our service to our generation. Amen? Why are we here? The multitude of us, in Jesus' name. And why are the faithful faithful? And I believe it's in part because you have a drive, a desire, a passion, a motivation to serve the Lord by serving the generation that we're in. I want to awaken that in some. I want to applaud those others who have embraced it. And I want to ignite the fire of God's purpose in a generation. We, 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 we began by using this as sort of like a movie scene that we see the end of the movie at the beginning and go back and fill in the rest of the, of the, the film, the dialogue, the script. And so I want to in part do that to talk about uh, this assignment of how God uses a generation and what a generation is and how it's tied to all of us in some respects. And we're gonna talk about the various generations, the seven or so generations that are uniquely positioned in our human experience. 
I want to begin by talking about what is a generation, amen? And we, we, we have oftentimes heard various things in describing a generation. We, we have, uh, we're aware that, that in many cases a generation is referred to as a span of time that's attached to uh, a, 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 a block of people or a group of people. Uh, usually we, we use the demarcation of um, parents to children is one generation, the children to grandchildren is another generation. And we use that as a reference point for us in our modern existence. We oftentimes have uh, seen a great blessing in a church where I've come to worship and to preach to five generations in a service. What a blessing. We have a, a grand, great grandfather and a and the grand, great grandchildren, and all the way down to five sets of them. Y'all ain't saying nothing. That's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. That you got a great grandfather, grandmother, and a great, 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 and grand, and, and mother, and then children. And it's just beautiful to see that. But it's becoming more rare. Amen. I am grateful to be a part of a family where I, the Joneses, my wife's parents, that they literally represent the, the anchor for the Jones family. And it's literally, when you count four generations, Papa and Mama Jones and Pastor Roy and I and TJ and then my nephew Cameron and uh, has children and uh, Jeremiah and Elijah, amen. Four beautiful generations. Uh, my daughters, Erica and Rachel, that's part of the third realm. But the idea is that it's a blessing to be able to have generations. I think I've got some more members of them. With Brother Jose and Gladys, uh, they are anchors to the Navarro clan, amen. And I know there's at least three or three generations. Uh, three generations. And them being the anchors uh, of parenting. And then I have the Leakses, amen. Amen. The Sister Cheryl and, and Arthur. They're, they're the anchors to the four generations. Isn't that right? You, you've got children, and they've got children, and their children got children. And I, I'm so blessed. At our 6 a.m. prayer, and we concentrate on praying for families on Friday. Yes. How she calls out her generations. Amen. Yes. So beautifully. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. It's a powerful thing. And I realize that God is a God of generations. Amen. He speaks and he moves and he makes himself known undoubtedly through this, this span of time and this union of peoples. And I, I know my English, I say peoples, which is a plural of a plural, amen. And so I wanna just hit some things that I want, I believe I didn't have a chance to really mine on Sunday that will help us to better understand God's plan and purpose. When, when we look at the word generation, we, we find that it occurs some 167 times within the pages of the King James Bible. And um, we, we find it's usage in every book of the Bible, uh, generation, say generation. We, 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 we all embrace our own calculator, and I describe what we oftentimes in this modern era use as uh, one clan or one cluster of the family uh, unit to the next cluster. 
But the Bible does a little something different. It actually gives a relative numerical value to it. Whereas in oftentimes the, the uh, secular speaking of a generation, maybe 20 to 30 years. And that's generally the time for, uh, for uh, an adult child to come into maturity, have children and their children to grow up to adulthood. So the span of the 20 to 30 years are common in our secular understanding. But God's ways are different from ours and his thoughts are different from ours. A man himself um, looks at having an inheritance sometimes in a very selfish way. I remember being in seminary and I loved the experience that I received in Oral Roberts. I highly encourage my brothers in the Lord, my sisters in the Lord who are called to go on to study to show themselves approved and sometimes going into a uh, ecumenical environment where you are in the classroom with Christian believers from all over the world who share their experiences in Christ help add to your, your, your preparation to preach the gospel. It's different if you were in a class full of Southern Baptists. What you hear in testimony and sharing than when you sit in a class with a Muslim who gave his life to the Lord and is used to having multiple wives. Y'all ain't saying nothing. A Korean or a Chinese person or, or someone from the Ukraine or South America and how Christ impacted their life and changed their culture. Amen. One of the experiences that I remember so distinctly, uh, one of our brothers who grew up in Africa, I'm not sure, I can't remember what nation of the great continent of Africa, but his, he was of a family where his father had multiple wives. And um, they practiced the Muslim religion. And he became saved. His father did. And he began to share some of the thinking of his father. Why he became a polygamist. Why he became a practicing Muslim. And uh, one of the things that he communicated to his son that when he grew up, he came from a very poor village and a very poor family. And his family and he were often the victims of others' brutalization because there was only a few of them. They were always outnumbered. And anything that they may have attempted to accomplish or acquire or obtain would oftentimes be lost to those who outnumbered him. So his father grew up with a mindset as a child that he would have a large family. Why? To be able to outnumber anybody that may try to take from him. Interesting how that seeded into to his heart. And it became part of the ethos or the developmental regime of his children until Jesus showed up and they got saved and they began to incorporate a different thinking but he had produced a generation of offspring that had the same mindset. I use that example to, to give support of how the Hebrew Bible uses or defines the word generation. And I, 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 I use the context of maybe out of the Ecclesiastes, if you turn there, we'll give, give address to it. But in the book of Ecclesiastes, there is a uh, wonderful scripture that allows us to see the power of a generation that I'll illustrate. If you turn there, I'll just read Ecclesiastes 1, verse 4. And it says this, 
for our understanding and our enrichment. Say so Ecclesiastes 1 and 4, it says this. And I'll just start in verse 1 for context. It says, the word of the preacher, hallelujah, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Vanity, vanity, saith he, saith the preacher, vanities of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath the man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. In these, these few verses and passages is a great revealing of the power of the generation. Here the Hebrew word door, D-O-R in its English um, presentation, is a Hebrew word that refers to generation and it's described as a period. And as I mentioned on Sunday that oftentimes we are being given a a, uh, a means by which to better understand our God. One, that he is not in time, he is eternal. And that time was given to us in its increments, in its assignments, and even in the term of a generation for our benefit to better understand his ways and to know where we stand. Say generation. And what's interesting, this Hebrew word means period of time or period relative to time, but it also means habitation or dwelling. Isn't that interesting? Generation. And the connotation is that in each span of time that's related to humanity and each generation of humanity, Something dwells within it, or something, or some measure, or some attribute exists within the generation. Y'all didn't see that. Y'all didn't see that. Another expression of what a generation means in the Hebrew is a condition or quality. Literally, a class of men. Say, I got class. I got class. I got class. When, when, when we hear that term, there's something that stands out when someone's got, when you say somebody's got class, something that stands out and something prevails and something is, is um, catches one's eye or is, is pertinent of attention. The idea of generation it's not just a span of time, but it is a it is a, it's a collection of character. It's a collection of, of, of habits that dwell within a segment of people that share the same block of time. All right. Thank you, Dee. <laughs> Thank you, Dee. And so when we, when we think about a generation and how God impacts it or how it has an influence, it gives us a greater understanding. It's not just mama them and granddaddy them and great grandma them. It's what they allow to dwell in them or what character inhabited them or what was part of them. And how much of that, as Ecclesiastes said, got passed on? Say, pass it on. Every generation impacts the next one. There is a tie or connection, not just genetically, but ethereally, spiritually. There is a connection related to it. And we want to say that there's a good connection, but it's not always good. Y'all ain't saying nothing. 
Turn to Matthew. Uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna mine some gold out of Matthew about the generation and the types of generation, and and, and I want you to see how important it is in the ethos or the mind of God. In that, as we open up the book of Matthew, which is considered the first book of the New Testament, and I sometimes have said that theologically Malachi seems to be the first book because it's the end of the intertestament period. That's just um, that's just like Paul said, as for me. Um, but it's, it has that reflective ability. But look how the book of Matthew starts. It says the gener gene genealogy of Jesus Christ, the book of generations of Christ. And he goes on in Matthew to list the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judas and his brethren, and Judas begot Pharez, and, and Zayar, and Ta of Tara. And far as begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Amenadad, and Amenadad begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Silom. I remember I was a young preacher about 15, 16, and the pastor was using me in the pulpit every now and then. He would let me read scripture, but he oftentimes didn't tell me what scripture he was going to give me to read. And I remember he gave me this to read. And it was a test. It put me in my place trying to pronounce all these names. I struggled, got tongue tied. And so I, I have a good, a confident mastery of them. Once you, once you trip and fall, y'all ain't saying nothing. And Salam got Boaz of Rashad. And Boaz begot Obed of Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David, and David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah, and Solomon begot Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa, and Asa begot Josephat, and Josephat begot Joram. These were all the kings the lineage, and, the, and they represent the generations that Jesus came through. Yes, yes. Say, generations matter to God. And it goes on and lists all of them, and then we get all the way up to verse 16, it says that Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Why is it important? Why is it listed? Why do they have these generations? Because it's important to God. Each of you and I and our families are important to God. You're not an accident. Oh. You're not a mistake. And I can go and talk about Roe versus Wade a little bit. Life matters to God. Hallelujah. Every life matters. Just imagine if Jesse wasn't born. Just imagine if Solomon didn't come out of David. Just imagine if Jesus' is father stepfather wasn't there. Generations matter to God. Your life matters to God. Your children's life matter to God. Your unborn grandchildren matter. Oh, glory to God. And I imagine some of these that were born weren't planned. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of them didn't follow the script of your life plan. But thank God nobody gave up on you. And you came and you established your place in the earth. Oh, I hope I can touch somebody's heart. Every life matters to God. 
and the generations or the, these passages or, or these doors become a door for somebody. The Hebrew word, that, that was a play on words, y'all didn't catch that. The Hebrew word door becomes a door, D-O-O-R, for somebody to pass through. Oh, y'all missed that. You can use that. T.D. Jakes, you can use it. I don't know how to. But God uses the generation. They're important to him. Even though he's eternal, he sees the Crocker generation. This mother up in Philly or D.C., wherever she is, saw Bishop Harvey Robinson and saw what Brother Bernard Crocker was coming through with his wife and his daughters. He saw Irvin Samuel Senior generation, y'all know Uncle Kid. <laughs> Uncle Kid had five or six kids and one of them was John Anthony. And who knew that John Anthony, he must have said, I had so many key brothers and sisters, I ain't gonna have a one child myself. I don't know how they came. Only Elder Quint came out of that. But each generation has purpose in God. And something that was in Urban Samuel Senior was passed on to John that came out of Quint. Is working his way through Quentin Jr., Jamarion, and Shante. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Purnell and Rennell is working his way through all the way down to the. How many generations y'all got? Y'all pretty strong too. Y'all got four too? Boy, y'all the youngest four generations in there. You win the hat. You win the trophy. You young whippersnapper. Four generations strong. Oh, I'm coming down your street. God is interested in the generations because in it, he's making himself known. Now this is, this is important as we do a comparison and contrast we've seen how um, Matthew 1 describes all these generations that Jesus came through. 42 generations. What's very common is for Kandarabasi, thank you, Lord. For Hebrew Israelite, especially those who were shepherds, they would in fact take great honor in knowing their generations. They would write them on their staff, their king, their father their son, that all the way down to the existing generation. They can take it all the way back to Adam. How they came through. They would start at Adam and go forward all the way up to where they were to establish themselves as a part of the house of Israel. If you talk to a Messianic Jew or a Jewish person now, they endeavor to show their connection to Israel, even now. They'll go back to their father, their father's father, and if they can, they'll take it all the way back to Adam. Y'all ain't saying nothing. And this is a sidebar. That's why I know that a culture that's robbed of their inheritance, of knowing their father, is diabolical and demonic. And many of us in the African American culture cannot take ourselves back, literally, past a certain place in history. That's intentional. But God be praised. We've been grafted in. Amen. Out of us. We're part of a, a family line. That's eternal and royal and great. I won't get. I won't. I won't go there tonight on the history and the research. But some of you in here, if not all of you, may find yourself 
in that same suit of biblical history. Even though you may call yourself Lightsey or Jones or Brown or Grimsley, there's another name in your blood and the DNA won't lie. Let me keep going. Get me out of here. Security, security. But you got God in your bloodline. You got God now. now. I want to just give you an observation of some things because generations are reflective of their condition. And there are subsets in every generation. Jesus revealed this in um, numerous places, but in Matthew 3 and 7, he begins to reveal to us because he addresses some of the subsets in that present generation. In uh, Matthew 3, starting in verse 1, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his remnant of camel's hair and a leathery girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him, I'm sorry, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, who, this is a subset of his generation, come to the baptism, he said unto them, O generation of good people, O generation of esteemed religious clergy, no, he said old generation of vipers, whole generational subset were looked at as slivering, poisonous, repulsive snakes who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. So this subset John is describing the what Matthew is describing are vipers. That in your, each generation there is good and honorable and loving and God-fearing, but there are also vipers and counterweights and distractors and, and sinful people, even religious people. And this is also seen, this evil, Attached to generations is seen in Luke 4 and 29 as well. It's a parallel. Go to Matthew 16. I want you to see this. 11, I'm, I'm sorry, Matthew 11, verse 16. And we're talking about generations. What's the generation composed of? Yes, people. But the quality of people is what? A generation has an identity of. This is what it says in uh, Matthew 11 and 16. This is Jesus talking. Say, Jesus. Say, Jesus. Call on him. Call on him. I'll start at verse 12. It says that Jesus said that from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered what? Violence. And the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied unto John. And if we, if ye will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. 
But where unto shall I liken this generation? Meaning, what is this generation like? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, we have piped unto you and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he had the devil. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified for her children. What does Jesus say? He said, this is a generation of people that just won't be satisfied. Religious hypocrites. You criticize John the Baptist. There's none greater. Jesus himself described him like an Elijah. You criticize him because he wouldn't have nothing to do with y'all. And he stayed out in the wilderness and wore a leather skirt named locusts and honey. Some of us do the same thing. Be careful. And then they criticized Jesus. Why? Because he did just the opposite. He drank, he had a little fun, he hung out with the publicans and the sinners. And then they criticized him. He says, just because we didn't pipe, dance to what you pipe, you threw us under the bus. He's describing that generation. Wicked, controlling, manipulative, unsatisfied. Uh, we, I hope none of us share that slice of the pie. So when we look at the conditions of a generation that are righteous, that are evil, that are wicked, but the generations reflect the condition of a people group at a set period of time. Matthew 17 and 17, Jesus says that this generation is perverse. Sounds like our generation. Y'all ain't saying nothing. That we gravitate in this generation like never before to more pornography and illicitness in our media, television, like never before. Anybody remember? Y'all ain't saying that. I'm, I'm going, I'm getting ahead of myself. But I want to, I want to, I want to use the chalkboard before I sit down since we're going to pull it all up and got everything going. <laughs> but how many people know that God uses the generations to communicate his will, his way, and allow us to see where we stand in comparison to the plan of God. I'm going to try to talk about a few of the generations and some of their characteristics. First one is the silent generation. They know to be the silent generation because this was the generation that came or was birthed during the time of um, the Great World War, World War I, and they were known as the silent generation. Why? Because they, they carried a certain character. They responded to the nation. They were loyal. They were committed. They were dedicated. Y'all ain't saying that. They were self-sacrificing. This is called the silent generation. WW1. They become the backbone of our nation and our world. Even just recently. They honored 
one of the last black army, I don't think they were officers, but she was part of a special corps of 800 African American women, even though they were persecuted because they were women and persecuted because they were black, they served their nation faithfully by processing the mail 24 hours a day, making sure that the mail that was sent to the soldiers got to their destination. Beautiful African American ladies sacrificed and served. They did it gladly. And they were just now honoring her service, the last of the group of 800 or so. She was in a wheelchair, but beautifully, beautiful woman, but was glad to serve the silent generation. Then, what generation came after the silent generation? Let me see if y'all, y'all with the bishop. That's right, the boomers. To the baby boomers. Why they call the baby boomers? They've been missing their wives, their girlfriends, and they were making up for lost time. Y'all ain't saying nothing. And they became one of the the largest population groups that were born in American history. But from this group of, um, of, uh, of citizens, they, they carried certain characters and characteristics. Can, can, can anybody, uh, who's got a nice handwriting? I'm gonna elicit some writings. I'm making you look like you got a nice handwriting. Don't, don't prove me wrong, but come and help pastor. And get one of his markers next to baby boomers, uh, side uh, next to it. Come on, give some of the characteristics of baby boomers. They're hippies. They're hippies. You sure? Yeah, they got high. They fought the Cold War. She said they're hippies. Do, do we have the date to it? Okay, 46 to 55. Some of you 65 as the end of it. Go ahead, give me some more characteristics of the baby. Hold on. If you're a baby boomer, you should be the first one to give us some words on it. Tell me something about the baby boomers. Big on like love and free love. Big on love and free love. <laughs> Part of the they were part of the civil rights movement. Anybody else? What was their work ethic like? Uh, yeah, great work ethic. Great work ethic. I bet you, baby, That's move right. on. Hey, <laughs> man, say your story. Give me some more. Anything else? What was their feeling about God? They believe God consciousness, God fearing. Attended church, brought their children to church. Seekers of knowledge, that's good. Okay. We'll put a pin there. What was the next generation that came up? The late bloomers. Tell me about the late bloomers. That's a subset of the baby bloomers, right? 56 to 64. Okay. Two income households. Two income. You've gone from, from silent, one income, one income, 
Now you're going into two incomes. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing. Hey, y'all, how you doing? Where you come from? <laughs> The Barbie doll came out. The Barbie doll came out. Two income household. So the woman that that worked in the in the in the wall factory, she wasn't going back. She got her own money. She ain't going back to the kitchen. She she gonna make her own money. Y'all ain't saying nothing. There's a change of mindset. This was the man that was taking care of all the bills. That's my responsibility, take care of the bills. My wife ain't gotta do nothing, I'm gonna take care of her. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Keep doing it, amen. <laughs> Keep doing it. But that was the wife that was there at his beck and call. That was, that was the wife that called him Lord. Y'all ain't saying nothing. That was the wife that was, y'all ain't saying nothing. That was the wife that, that brought him his food. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing. Well, wait till we get down here. Questions, do they, do wives even cook anymore? Y'all ain't saying nothing. Y'all ain't saying, do men still pay the bills anymore? Y'all ain't saying nothing. We ain't got down here. Okay. Give me the next one. Give me the next generation. Yeah, I got, I got, I got, I got crucified because I missed a couple of these generations in the example. I said, I know I skipped some, but this is a we'll, we'll make up for it. Okay, Generation X. Somebody tell me something about Generation X. Nineteen eighties to what? No, late sixties. Generation X, what, what category has it from 65 to 79? Okay, okay, that's yeah. us. That's us. Yeah. Generation X, tell me something about Generation X. Technology. Oh my gosh. Generation X believes in technology. These generations don't even want nothing to do with technology. Anybody still got a checkbook? Yeah. This, this generation don't. Yeah. Anybody still got cash? Anybody still believe in cash? Yeah. This generation don't want nothing to do with cash. Yeah. This is also ministry training. This is also evangelism training. Y'all ain't saying nothing. <laughs> that, that's a good why because we went through some things so you got something they need and they got a skill set you need give me a, the next generation Millennials or Generation Y in some categories they're called Generation Millennials, Generation Y, or Generation Next. All three of those have been identified for Millennials. Tell me about Millennials. Everything online. PlayStation. Xbox. Entitled. The selfie generation. Here's the sacrifice generation. But now it's a generation It's all about me. Or what you say, sister? A generation, I don't need a man. I can do bad by myself. I can take care of myself. Where did they get this from? How did this mindset come to pass? Huh? High divorce rate. Great importance of marriage here. Marriage is not important. We can live together. Marriage is just a piece of paper. As a matter of fact, 
We have to not be mad. Redefining marriage. Man and woman. Down here. You know what? This generation marries trees. I literally saw an article of a woman married a tree. <laughs> Marry themselves. They don't want to, they want they don't want traditional jobs. They don't they don't they don't identify with tradition. Not even traditional marriage, not traditional job. They don't want to work, they don't want to wear a suit and tie. Expensive dinners. <laughs> they don't believe in coming to church, they don't believe in Give it to a religious institution. Oh, nope. oh we got work to do, beloved. That's good. That's good. That's good. We, we, we're looking at something. Something got transferred to each generation. It's failure to launch. Failure to launch. That's good. Explain what that means, darling. They staying at home when they're 30. Years old, yeah. Yes. And they ain't planning to go nowhere. Oh, that's good. Failure to launch. They are comfortable staying rent free. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Yes. Yes. At mom and dad's yes. house. They feel entitled. They feel entitled. Mm -hmm. There literally was a case where parents had to take their son to court yeah. and kick him out of the house. And he's about 35, 37 years old. Mm -hmm. And he was upset that they said he had to go. Very upset. <laughs> <laughs> he was very upset. Yeah. Even though we've said some challenging things, God said, I got to work with this. God said, I, I got to move. In the, you see, that there is an indictment that we're also seeing. Somebody forgot to pass on God. And he just, all it takes is one generation not to know God for God to be worked out of the world. All it takes is one generation to say, we, we, we're going to we're going to try the world without God for a generation. You know you can say anything you want. I was just thinking about that when you talked about the, um, what generation? I don't know if it's a silent generation, but that's why we need our grandmothers and grandfathers. You see this right here? Because even if the children, if you say one generation, so that generation might be, okay, I'm independent, I don't have to go to church, and that's why we need grandmothers. Because they'll bring the babies mm. to church. Amen. Many a Sunday, I see Sister Cheryl bring the grandbabies right on that road. Bring the babies. I'm not saying that's like their children, that's right. but the enemy tries to attack them. Like you said, each generation. And like you said, that's why we need all the generations together. We, we need them. We need each generation. And I, I can see how God has his hand on the grandparents generation because they're grabbing the, the, the children. That's, that's good, that. Pastor Roy. Even, even, even back then, my generation, even at the day, if, if your household didn't go to church, you had neighbors that had to take the children to church. Community, Community. was key. Where individual vigilante reigns here. I was just talking to a millennial and they were living in an apartment community and I asked him, I said, and they were going through something, I said, well, do, do you know your neighbors? Can you ask your name? I don't know them. I, I, don't, I, I don't talk to them. But we grew up in community. Well, everybody helped raise you. And you got to make it from Miss Dawkins, Samuel, when you cut up down to her house. And she got on the phone and called your mama. And then you got another. 
Community raised us. Isn't that beautiful? Community makes unity. So we're living in a society where we're fragmented. We're disconnected. We, are, we don't even know our neighbors. Do you know your neighbors? Hey, Aaron and Jennifer. Hey, Mother. Mother Evelyn. Do you know your neighbors? Do you know your neighbors? We are living in the generation where these values are flipped almost opposite. Pastor Jones, did you raise your hand? Did you have something you want to say? Yes, sir. Uh, that's actually what happened uh, when the children of Israel uh, went to Egypt. In Exodus 1 and 8, it says, when they arose, the pharaohs did do not Joseph. And the reason it says that because uh, Joseph was who, how they became, how they were blessed through him. And he became the second in line, you know. But after Joseph died, the children of Israel, uh, God wouldn't pass down to them. And they became the slaves. <coughs> and God sent Moses. To bring that generation out of Egypt so that they would be reintroduced to God. Now you now you hit my you hit my punchline with six minutes left tonight. God will always in every generation raise up a remnant that hadn't forgotten. They had forgotten God how he brought them through, hadn't forgotten what the Lord taught them along the way, hadn't forgotten how to love everybody, hadn't forgotten how to serve. You see, David served his generation and the report of his life exists today. I still hadn't finished but God is calling us, you and I, to find a place to serve our generation, to make the impact that will change someone's life. Say, I'm here to serve my generation. Yes. Because we got it. We got the most time in with him. We know better. We spent time. We were in church all day. When they hardly went to church. To whom much is given, much is required. God has imparted. How many times he showed up for us. And now they don't even recognize when he's showing up for them. How many times did God bless us? And they got the overflow of the blessing. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I believe, I believe all the time when there's a class action suit, y'all ever get them notices? Class action lawsuit. You're eligible for something. I believe God tried to get a blessing to me. It's all them other people got, got a blessing along the way because God tried to get a blessing to me. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Y'all ain't saying but we're the generation that knows it. And so we're going to have to be the generation that cries out the loudest. <clears throat> Live the holiest. Be the one that endures even the more for righteousness sake. I'm worried about some of these generations. What's after why? Is, is why? Anything after why yet? Yeah. Is Yes. Is it Alpha? Alpha. I don't even know. Alpha. Alpha. Alpha, that's right. Yeah. Uh, anybody know the characteristics of Alpha? Yeah. I can I can I can say to you that if this is 
the example to build on because every one is a diminishing group. When we think about sensitivity to God, serving God, righteousness, holiness. Would, would the alpha generation be characteristic of an alpha male? Are you talking about an alpha male? No. I just looked it up. I don't think that's. It's, I don't know. It's the children of the millennials. It's the children of the millennials. Well, let's talk about the children of millennials. Uh, computer generated virtual screen time. Hold on. Lack of communication is such as. Their ability to communicate is tied to computer. This is a generation where children are having children. Children are raising children. They're, this, they're the same generation almost. <laughs> and they seem to be not to hear and listen about the things of God and even question you. Oh. Is it time to pray? Why didn't you pray? You forgot to say your grace. Things like that, you know, that in my in, in my generations, as I bring it up, the more we talk about the Lord, they remind us mm. of what we say in God. Opposed to the millennial, their parent, who was like, I heard you, Grandma. I heard you. Mm. So you, you're saying that's hope for the house. I know that the millennials have a tendency to be less religious, but seeking a spirit. Yeah. They, they don't want to be attached to the church, but they. They are looking for a spiritual encounter from somewhere, and they're open to whoever and whatever that will produce it. Right now, many are latching on to, to substances to generate a spiritual encounter. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, there's, there's, chemistry that's attached to their spirituality. They'll take a certain drug that will produce a certain quote unquote spiritual effect and they identify that as a spiritual encounter and they are very much into my truth. Write that down, my truth. Seeking after my truth rather than the truth. I saw one more hand and then we're going to wrap up for tonight. Yes, Sister Just Minister Charlene. Pertaining to my experience with quite a few of the alphas um, being raised by the millennials, they're almost um, more adult like than uh, the child like hmm. mentality that we see. They're adult children. They're right, that's right, because they're communicated with as they are equal to their parents. Uh, so they have a different kind of a. Uh, demeanor about them. They're more uh, mature acting, although it's a child, but they have a very mature character. Is there an end with the alpha? How do you think the millennials respond when they see that? You think they are open to it, or are they close to it, or? They're shocked, but that's how they that's how they treat them, almost as if they're with them. They talk to us on our level. They, they treat him as a friend. Sister Cheryl, I said Charlene was laughing, but go ahead, Sister Cheryl. You know, Tiara is pregnant. Don't put no business all out there. Everybody get it on. She's showing now. So uh, every night she's getting the kiss. So I'm going to show you the Yeah, I have the same experience with 
my three-year-old and he's here from the window. Um, but he he was talking to me one day and he said to me, bro, you know, bro. <laughs> and I'm like, you're but he was talking to me, I said, I'm not your bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've even heard, I've even heard, I guess these are some of the, the end of millennials refer to the, a woman of the opposite sex as a bro. You know, someone they're, they're romancing or dating, they'll refer to them as bro. And I said, really? So, so we're, we're going to close right now. But I want to thank you so much, so much, Sister Megan. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise for Sister Megan helping us. And all of you which are awesome inputs in helping me. What, what, what we're doing tonight is helping us to better see how to serve this present generation. And it may require that we who are in this area here, and you call a woman brother, that's a fight. Or if a child speaks in a way to an adult, it's considered disrespectful. And you, that we need to understand that this is how this generation has been formed. And that in order to reach them, we're going to have to better understand them. Not to say that we got to like everything they do, but how can we show Jesus to them so they come out saved? They come out changed. And we're going to mind some more things in prayer, mind some things in practice. But even in the church, do we have a representation for the generations? Is there a place for the children to feel that this is where they want to be? Is there enough technology or the sight and sound things that this generation identifies with? Are we dressing to help invite them and then by, with our presence help them grow to another level? To serve this generation I call and to fulfill is a Baptist anthem, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. Beloved, we have to be wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. And I don't know who I'm talking to. My brother pastor, my brother evangelist, we're trying to win this generation, and they won't come the way we came. But we gotta find a way to win them for the Lord. God moves through the generations. He, he speaks through the generations. And he reminded us that, that he'll use the generational marker to mark the return of Christ. I said this before and I conclude with this, that God revealed through scripture that the generation that sees these things, what things? In particular, Jesus said in Matthew 23, that continues on in Matthew 24 when we see the fig tree bud. Some theological dispositions would hold that as just a figurative narrative identifying a seasonal response. But I believe there's more to it for the fig tree also represents Israel itself, the nation. And when Israel was dispersed, it was not until 1948 at the Balfour Declaration that Israel was reconstituted. Can a nation be born in a day? Jesus said that generation that sees the fig tree bud will be the generation that will see the coming of the Lord. 
as we establish this is a 65, 70, 80 year period, we are coming to the fulfillment of that generation. It's no period. Say Jesus is coming. Jesus. I'm convinced that there may be a revival that will be incubated here. That's what we got to pray. I believe that there will be many that will be pulled away and will realize it after Jesus raptures the church and the tribulation begins. And they'll say, what mama said and grandmama said, that's Jesus stuff was real. But they will have to go through. And they'll have to pull from the strength of the silence and the work ethic of the baby boomer and the innovation of the millennium to make it through hell on earth. Come on, somebody. It is at the door. I want you to be ready when he comes, but be ready to share Jesus for he's coming soon. Let's close. Father, we thank you and praise you for this chance to come as we continue to talk about your generation and how you desire for generational blessings to go from one period of faith to the other, one people group to the other. You just didn't want to bless one generation, but you sent your son Jesus through 40 and two generations. You sent your blessings. And Lord God, we won't drop the ball. We'll continue to send Jesus to all those that exist in our generation and those who follow. Now, Father, help us. Help us fulfill our assignment to reach our generation, to serve our generation with innovation, with faithfulness, with quality and character that others can easily pick it up and run with it. Forgive us when we drop the ball. Thank you for a renew. In Jesus' name. Beloved, if you're watching me and you have not given your life to the Lord, new life begins with accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He is the Lamb of God that that was assigned to die for our sins. History reveals through over 3,000 manuscripts the message of Jesus Christ. There was living testimony recorded through history communicating that there were eyewitnesses that saw him after he was resurrected. There is no grave where they found his bones. They found the bones of Tutankhamun and other Egyptian kings and people that lived in antiquity, they cannot find the bones of Christ because he is risen. Jesus lives and he's coming back. And he said, if you accept me, that he will save you. He that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Pray this prayer with me. Father, forgive me for I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I accept Jesus, your son, as my Savior and Lord. Fill me with your Holy Ghost. All things pass away. I'm born anew in Jesus Christ. God be praised. If you pray that prayer, you say, Hallelujah! Your sins have been removed. You live anew in God. Find a Bible teaching church. Come and join us. 1919 Southwest 27th Avenue in the great city of Ocala. Come find a Bible believing church and learn of the Lord. We thank God for you being with us tonight. Thank God all on the campus. Thank God for those on the Tampa group. We speak blessings to you and we'll see you next time.